my name is Ellen Cook. I'm going to be talking about the biological potential of microbial environments in extreme hyper um, arid, or I'm sorry, <laughs> microbial ecosystems in extreme hyper arid environments. Um, first, I'd like to thank my collaborators, um, Jared Broderick, Craig, Craig Everode, and Alfonso Davila, as well as NASA Ames Research Center, where I was able to conduct all of my research. Um, it's been a dream this summer. I also want to say thank you to the Young Scientist Program for allowing me to present this, uh, these findings to you today. So the search for life on Mars begins by following its water. Um, so our current understanding of the red planet is extremely different than what we, um, the assumptions that we have about prehistoric Mars. Um, Mars in its early history was very warm. Um, it had a, hot, a lot of humidity and possibly even oceans, as you can see on this leftmost image. Um, but over the course of 4 billion years, a lot of changes can happen. And there have been, um, we've kind of, have this understanding that there's been this gradual decrease in water over time. And so this gradual decrease in water, we kind of signify or we define that as the aridity gradient of Mars. And so this aridity gradient is mainly due to the sun and the sun affects um, this gradient in three different ways. So these rings around Mars are signifying the magnetic field and more specifically the protective um, ring around Mars and like our planet, we also have um, a magnetic field. And so that just protects us from all of the solar stuff that gets expelled from the sun on a you know continuous basis and so over time these solar winds that are expelled from the sun destroy the magnetic field um, creating a less protective layer around mars which causes atmospheric escape so the solar winds now are able to penetrate past the magnetic layer a magnetic field layer and into the atmosphere sweeping it away causing it to disperse into space now this also has a kind of a follow-up um I guess like pathway for the sun, it kind of increases the photon flux or the light availability on the surface, which causes um, sublimation of the water ice. So this is ice, instead of going from solid to liquid water to gas, it goes to from solid to gas very, very quickly. And that um, pushes the water into the atmosphere, which is already get being um, swept away. And that breaks up the water molecules into space and kind of it's lost forever. And so our understanding of this aridity gradient um, across time, coupled with our understanding of early Mars environments and early life on Earth, we can kind of so sort of put together a picture about what early life on the red planet would look like and the, some of the adaptive behaviors or environmental adapt adaptations it would um, life would need in order to um, survive these um, this aridity gradient. But in order to confirm or verify our understandings or um, our suggestions, we need an Earth analog environment. So the question becomes, is there an Earth analog that's similar to Mars that also displays this aridity gradient? The answer is yes. Um, here on this image, you can see on the left is a picture of Mars, and on the right is a picture of Earth, and that specifically is the Atacama Desert. Um, so the Atacama Desert is a desert in the northern region of Chile, um, and it is one of the, if not the driest part, um, driest place on Earth. And so it, instead of um, expressing an aridity gradient across time, like we see with Mars, it um, expresses it across distance. So what does that mean? <laughs> so as you move from the southern region of the desert to the northern region, um, depicted here in this aridity index, you can see that there's an increase in extreme dryness from hyper arid to extreme hyper arid. So what does this mean for life? Well, here in this diagram, you can see as in more humid environments, we're going to have a lot more biodiversity, both on a multicellular level, so lots of trees, lots of shrubs, and on a unicellular level, so underneath the subsurface, there's lots of, you know, fungi, which we've heard a lot about today, as well as bacteria. And as we move toward the right side of this image, um, we can see that aridity is increasing, and that causes a systemic breakdown of the ecological environment. So there's less vegetation, there's less microbial diversity, and there's a lot less nutrient cycling occurring. And so for the purposes of my research, we're focusing on subsurface um, Mars environments. So when we look at subsurface environments in the Atacama, we want to look specifically in these halite nodules. These are salt mineral structures. Um, and when we look at them, we do see that there are signs of endolithic microbial communities. What does that mean? That means that these communities are inside the porous crevices within the rock. And we know that there are many different perks to um, 
to these endolithic lifestyles, right? So there's lots of um, high water retention, good thermal stability, and extensive UV protection, all of which are going to be really important for life on Mars. But with every perk, there are downsides. And so we know that one of the downsides is limited gas exchange. But most importantly, we have this understanding that photosynthesis will be presumably blocked because not only does it have to come past the surface, past the atmosphere, touch down on the surface, it needs to go beneath the subsurface and inside of rocks. So our question really becomes, what adaptive strategies are these photosynthetic rock dwellers using to offset low light availability? So we studied the biological potential, and that just means um, the potential for these organisms to exist and propagate or grow within this environment. And so we use Cynococcus elongatus, um, and we use extreme low light availability conditions to understand the adaptive behavior or the physiological changes that it undergoes in order to survive in these subsurface environments. So the way that we did this is we looked at um, the, we grew the cultures in three different light levels um, at three different light intensities, 35, 11, and six micromole photons, uh, or yeah, photon flux is just um, the light availability over time. And so we investigated three different biological potentials under these um, three different light levels. I'm going to primarily be talking about growth rate and pigment production. So growth rate, we took op optical density measurements, which just um, shows how dense the cell cultures get over time. That's showing how they're growing over time. And then we did photopigment extractions. Um, photopigments are light absorbing pigments that help to um, improve photosynthesis. And um, we extracted chlorophyll and phycobilly proteins in order to understand the um, pigment changes that occur. So in our first experiment, we found that S. elongatus is a able to recover growth rates in light as low as six micromole photon flux. So what does this mean? It means that between the three different light levels, 35, 11, and six, there was not a lot of variation in the amount of cells that grew over the eight day period. And you can see that in this diagram, all of the lines, there's slight variation, but they're all pretty um, aligned across the eight day period. So with that, we wanted to know if there was a limit to or the a, a bottom to the amount of um, light that these organisms could get in order to recover their growth rates. And so we tested two micromole photon flux and one micromole photon flux and found that um, growth rate recovery was significantly inhibited. So across an eight day period, they aren't able to recover as um, they were when they were getting at least six micromole photon flux. So our observations of these cultures also showed pigment changes, um, and you can see that here. So these are all the same bacteria, but they're grown under different light availability. And so we can see that at 35, the most amount that these cultures got, they are this bright lime green. And as we move to less light, they become this more blue, green, emerald, um, deep green color. And so we wanted to understand if there was a quantifiable link between the production of these light adaptive pigments and light availability. And we found, uh, and we did a chlorophyll pigment extraction in um, order to do that. And we use magnesium spiked methanol to lyse open the cell. So that's what methanol does. And then magnesium grabs onto the chlorophyll and pulls it away from the cellular debris so that we're just left with chlorophyll pigments at the end. And we were able to, um, to see that cyanobacteria do produce more chlorophyll pigment in response to low light availability. And there's actually a negative correlation. So as you decrease the amount of light that's available, you increase the amount of chlorophyll content um, that these molecules or that these bacteria are able to produce. And if you think about it, that makes sense to what we saw in our growth curve, because those three um, top lines were all pretty much um, around the same growth rate. And so that kind of shows that even though the light is going down, they're producing these uh, more of these pigments in order to um, to make sure that their growth rates are uh, sustainable. So this is not the end of this research. We need to, to get a full picture, we need to optimize our phycobilly protein extraction. And this is just another light absorbing protein that helps to optimize photosynthesis. Um, we're using sonication right now, but we're not getting the yield that we want. And so we want to kind of improve that. Um, and so that's what we're still continuing to do. We also um, wanna do metabolic um, analysis essays on these organisms to understand O2 production as a result of their photo acclimation to these different light levels. And then we also wanna do genomic sequencing to understand gene expression and what sorts of genes are being turned off and turned on um, as a result of these different photo acclimation light levels.
So these are just preliminary data points that um, will act as analytical inputs for our predictive gym model. And we were focusing on biomolecules, but genomics and metabolic activity are also, like I said, what we're going to be working on in the future. Um, the gym model it is a gym, genomic scale metabolic model that will help um, us predict theoretical biological targets um, for future Mars missions. So in summary, um, cyanobacteria do employ physical light dependent um, adaptive behaviors, such as increased photopigment production to offset light energy deficits. Um, what does that mean? It means as you decrease light availability, uh, photopigment production is going to increase. That's going to improve the overall light absorbance in these low light availability environments to help maintain that growth potential or biological potential. And then there, we did find out that there is a minimum threshold of light that's needed to restore the growth potential of these organisms. Next steps, like I said, optimizing photopigment extractions, doing metabolic activity assays, and doing genomic analysis, as well as redoing all of these experiments on a cyanobacteria specifically isolated from the Atacama because this was really just a proof of concept to see whether or not these bacteria are able to have adaptive behaviors based on um, extreme conditions. So that is my talk. And if you have any questions, I would be happy to answer them. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Great job, Ellen. If we have questions, you can ask your questions in the chat or raise your hand. Sanjoy has a question right away. For others, feel free to raise your hand. I'll call on you as needed. Hey, Ellen, great presentation. Thank you very much. I have a comment and a question. The comment is that you're going to get in trouble if you call a flux with the units of concentration, like micromoles, like you did. I suspect you're missing per meter squared per second, but that's neither here nor there. And the, the question is about uh, temperature. So Mars is a lot colder than the Atacama, obviously. And I'm wondering what are the temperature effects in uh, pigment production? So we actually didn't investigate that, but that will go into, like I said, all of this is preliminary. So we are going to eventually um, focus on expanding our parameters. So right now we were just trying to focus on light, but eventually we will get to um, other things. Like we didn't even address aridity in this study. So um, as we continue, we will um, be kind of constraining our, um, our parameters around this uh, experiment to kind of help um, define some those sorts of things, like how temperature affects it, how aridity, um, desiccation, um, irradiation, all of those things affect the microbes and their adaptive behaviors. Awesome. Priya, you have your hand up as well. Absolutely fascinating. Thank you. I mean, uh, this is this is something, it makes my heart beat a little faster because we have a, a cyanobacterium that we're really super interested in that's halophilic also. And we were growing it and it just reminds me, takes me back 15 years and um, absolutely fascinating and it it follows a similar pattern as the purple membrane production for our halo archaea that you know the whole purple earth hypothesis and all that absolutely i mean sorry i gotta stop so did you so you actually got to do bench work mm -hmm. yes at nasa ames you are one of the golden lucky ones because all the rest of there's so many of the others who just had to do literature search which is great and i shouldn't say just but you know who or, or and even our students were just doing just doing bioinformatics but you got to do bench work you are very very lucky um, I'm a bench rat myself, so yes, yeah, I wonderful. On the bench. Um, <laughs> absolutely, you know, fascinating. I can't wait to see what you get out of it, and I'm going to put my email to you. So I want, I want to hear more about this because this is really, these are my cousins. You know, we're Halarchia. You're saying it's, and the stromatolites. You know, I there was that uh, video that Mike something or the other put it up, and I'm the general thing. Fantastic! You're bringing this whole project together. I'm going to stop babbling. Just one thing. Genomics, transcriptomics. Genomics will give you the genome. Transcriptomics will give you the expression. Um, the only reason I know it is because we we did the first uh, transcriptomics ever done on the first halo archaeal genome. Um, because it, one of the issues with the uh, halo archaeal genome is that it's high in GC. And even uh, Craig Venter, who did the human genome, said, no, it's, you can't be done. And our motto is be realistic, demand the impossible, ask my students. Um, but this is fantastic. So are you going to personally, this is my last thing, uh, uh, you're going to continue on with the project, I hope? Yes, I, yes, we are continuing until next August, I believe, on this project. So we will be, like I said, doing that gym model um, and doing some more preliminary work to kind of constrain the, um, the parameters of this research. So awesome. Thank you. Thank you guys so much. <laughs>